Thank you. Um, so I was asked to talk in 15 minutes about unintended pregnancy, HIV, and STIs, <laughs> okay? <laughs> And uh, I feel like I remember my first world history course I ever had as an undergraduate where my first exam was describe the history of the world. <laughs> okay. uh, same, same scenario that I, I, I feel in. So I'm going to uh, just very briefly go over some uh, statistics indicating the uh, extent to which um, unintended pregnancies, HIV and SCIs affect the age groups that we're talking about. And then I'm going to uh, pick out four areas of research that I think we could advance uh, in uh, advancing and, and do some good things if we pursue them in more depth. So, um, unintended pregnancies in youth. Uh, unmarried women in their 20s account for about uh, a million unplanned pregnancies each year, okay, 1.3 million. That's a rate of over 2,700 per day, all right. Uh, unmarried women between 20 and 24 account for 65% of these. About half of all abortions are to women in their 20s, a rate of about 1,600 abortions per day. More than two-thirds of unmarried women who experience un unintended pregnancy are not cohabiting, so this is not limited to cohabitors. And rates of unplanned pregnancy among teenagers, as most of you know, has been declining, but the declines for women in their 20s have been much more modest. Uh, uh, in, in recent years. So unintended pregnancies is, uh, is, a, is a real problem with uh, youth in their 20s. For HIV, there are about 50,000 new HIV infections diagnosed each year in the United States. Uh, and that rate's been fairly stable for many years. Um, I present uh, rates for 2008 through 2011 there, as well as the, the absolute uh, numbers. And the thing to highlight there, if you look in 2011, the age groups where uh, the number of people with uh, uh, newly diagnosed HIV infections is highest in the 20 to 29 year old group. Um, so we definitely have uh, issues there. Here's uh, HIV uh, diagnosis by uh, certain risk subpopulations and you can see that uh, men having sex with men uh, are a dominant category uh, in the uh, first three there. And then we have black heterosexual uh, men and women are next. So there's definitely uh, disproportional uh, hits here in terms of HIV, <laughs> followed by Hispanic. Sexually transmitted infections in youth, there are about 20 million new STI infections per year. Okay, uh, 15 to 24 year olds count for about half of those. That's a rate in 15 to 24 year olds of about 27,000 infections per day. Okay, that's pretty staggering. Um, HPV uh, accounts for a large number of those at, at 14 million, but uh, even if you uh, remove HPV from the equation, uh, it's still a, a huge amount of STI infections that we're experiencing. Here's the estimated number of new and existing sexually uh, transmitted infections as estimated by the CDC. So, um, for uh, STIs that were included in these rates, there were eight of them, uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, uh, was uh, were present and many of those inf infections go undetected because they have no symptoms. They're easily treated, uh, treated with simple antibiotics, but um, one of the main problems is is that they often don't have symptoms, so people don't know they have them. And if they are left untreated, uh, they can have non-trivial health consequences. Percentage of youth in their 20s with genital herpes infection is about 10%. Percentage for black non-Hispanic youth is over 30%, okay? Uh, number of new STI infections in youth is roughly about equal in men and women. So we have our work cut out for us, okay, in all of these areas. They're very, uh, uh, the rates are way too high and uh, uh, we really need uh, better interventions than what we've had and uh, we really need to bring science to bear. Um, 
I'm going to uh, discuss four areas where I think um, uh, we really need research and it could be very helpful. Um, in when I was thinking about what directions to emphasize, uh, there are many that I could talk about that are tied to specific content areas. So for example, uh, research on the efficacy of contraceptive counseling to prevent unintended pregnancy. But what I've decided to do is to emphasize more general research directions that cut across the areas and aren't necessarily specific to uh, uh, one of those areas and that will have applicability outside of sexual risk behavior as well. As I discuss these, uh, my biases uh, in training as a psychologist will, will show through, so bear with me on that. All right, first I wanna uh, stress and talk through is how important it is that we build a science, sil uh, science of tailored and targeted interventions. Um, most interventions involve communication of some form. Uh, we want to convey information, knowledge, or engage people in tasks, so they'll develop certain skills and orientations that will be protective. Uh, with computers and digital media uh, so widespread in youth, uh, we now have the capability of reaching millions of people in very cost-efficient ways where we can individualize the information that we give them. So instead of giving interventions of one size fits all, we are fast moving into the uh, capabilities of being able to individualize uh, information to, the, uh, to individuals through uh, delivery on computers and, and digital media. The idea I have in mind here is that people basically provide uh, background information uh, to us in interactive sessions with computers, uh, including their demographics, their personalities, their lifestyles, their beliefs, their norms, their orientations, and things like that. And then we can individualize the information that they get uh, based on that background information. There are uh, seven different facets of communication uh, on which we can potentially tailor information. And the issue is, uh, what kind of science do we have to guide our choices on each one of these uh, dimensions? So uh, in choosing to present information to people, we can pick out who the source of the communication is going to be, what the content of the communication is going to be, how we're going to uh, say things, or the style of the communication, communication timing, frequency of the communication, the communication context, and the communication channel. Uh, I use it in person, is it uh, through um, the internet, uh, through uh, smartphones or whatever, okay? Um, what we need is a science that will guide us on making choices among these, and we are woefully inadequate in that science. Uh, much of what we do, we try to identify the determinants of behavior and why people do things that they do, that they do why they engage in risk behavior. But once we've identified those determinants, that's only half the story. The other half is how do we change those things? How do we bring about change? And that's where we need help and that's where we need, need a science. If someone comes to a web page uh, by whatever means, um, and I want to help that individual not contract an STD and, and, and empower that individual so they don't contract an STD. What background information am I going to ask that person? And then given that background information, uh, who am I going to choose to provide information to that individual? What am I going to say? How am I going to say it? Uh, how often am I going to repeat it to the person? Uh, when am I going to say it? These are the kinds of questions that we really need, uh, uh, need help with. I uh, have worked with this literature quite a bit, and uh, one of the things that I tried doing uh, that I thought would be interesting was uh, I do a lot of work with uh, parent intervention programs with adolescents. So I decided in the sexual risk behavior area to get a copy of all uh, intervention manuals that uh, uh, have been, or all, 
I looked at all the interventions and I tried to get their manuals so that I could look to see how did they orient towards these different things and exactly what techniques were they using and to what extent might they be informed by science. And it was a pretty uh, disheartening experience, okay? Uh, half the people I contacted never even responded to me. The manuals that I did find, uh, some people wouldn't give me their manuals, and then the people whose manuals I did get, the manuals were uh, not optimal, is, uh, is what I can say uh, with that. So I think this is something that uh, we could really uh, need, need research on and could really uh, develop. Uh, second area where I think we need to uh, uh, pursue research is the integration of behavior specific and common cause intervention design principles. Okay. Uh, those of us who work with adolescents know there are interventions that focus on behavior specific outcomes where we're aimed specifically uh, designing interventions to address topics like sex and drugs and alcohol. And there are also those of us who develop intervention programs that are more broad-based and focus on common determinant uh, approaches of behavior, such as positive youth development approaches and approaches like that. Uh, I believe we really need to do research to uh, integrate these two approaches, that um, uh, the integration of them is critical. In the diagram that I put up here, I'm illustrating the common cause approach where the idea is that you have uh, different risk behaviors uh, uh, that we're interested in understanding and trying to impact. And then we have certain common causes that we think impact those. And those common causes are going to drive up the correlations between those risk behaviors. In addition to the common causes, there are also causal mechanisms between the behaviors themselves. So we know, for example, that alcohol use can impact directly uh, unsafe sex independent of any uh, common causes like emotion regulation or SES, okay? Um, Meta-analyses that have looked at the uh, correlations among uh, problem behaviors uh, like this suggest that uh, they are important, that they, uh, the correlations among problem behaviors are, are there and they're real, but they also suggest that there are very large amounts of unique variants that are influencing each behavior. In fact, the typical, uh, the average that you find across different meta-analyses is about 65% of the variation in the problem behaviors is unique variants. It's unique to that specific problem domain and about 35% of the variance is uh, due to common mechanisms between them. So there's a huge amount of unique variance and there's very important common variance to these, okay? Um, I think that it's very important that uh, we try to integrate uh, into uh, uh, unified uh, interventions uh, those that take both a, a unique problem behavior orientation as well as those that uh, use the more common uh, common approach. Okay, I'm gonna skip over uh, one slide in the interest of time. Okay, uh, a third area I wanna talk about uh, is a science of decision making, of split second decision making. I'm gonna tell you a little anecdote uh, to lead into this. When I was a graduate student, I went to work with Marty Fishbein at the University of Illinois. I remember talking with Marty about how complicated it was to predict behavior and how difficult it was to predict behavior. And uh, I'll still never forget when Marty said to me, Jim, uh, predicting behavior is really easy, all right? You're making this big deal about attitudes, personality, norms, and all this stuff, and it's really simple. Here's how you predict behavior. You ask somebody if they're gonna perform it. If they say yes, you predict they're gonna perform it. If they say no, you predict they're not gonna perform it. And you would be amazed at how accurate you can be if you do that, okay? And he was right, all right? There's a ton of research that, that shows that's the case. However, we also know that there are many cases where people intend to do things or decide to do things and they don't do them, or they intend not to do them and they end up doing them anyway. 
And so Marty uh, and myself have developed theories surrounding all the factors that uh, come into play and that disrupt the intention behavior relationship. Why is it people end up doing things they didn't intend to do or they don't do things that they intended to do? And there's a whole set of theoretical uh, constructs that have been developed surrounding that. And these are some that we all know of that come into play. But the one that I want to highlight is down under the behavioral intention in uh, small letters, decision instability, okay? Because this is so important. Uh, people change their minds, and they change their minds at the last second, okay? We intend to do things. We have the best of plans. We fully intend to do stuff. And then at the last second, at the split second, just before the behavior has to be enacted, we change our minds. Okay, there's the decision instability. I think one of the things that we need to do is to better understand these split second decisions that people make in situations. What are the factors that are influencing these? We know that uh, in situations people make cognitive appraisals and affective appraisals of what's going on around them. Based on those appraisals, certain information enters working memory and short term memory and then they act on the basis of what information is in working in short-term memory. Uh, and sometimes they'll just change their minds based on that. I think as we understand these split-second decision processes that we can do a lot towards uh, alleviating uh, uh, decision instability in ways that we don't want them to be uh, unstable. And um, I think it has a lot of important intervention implications for the way we develop, uh, develop our interventions. Okay, the final thing I want to mention is, uh, I'll go real quick on this one, is sex and love, okay? And the importance of studying couples. Now most of you, when I say love, might be thinking of love. I'm referring to a technical term, left out variable error, okay? <laughs> it's a modeling term in statistics where uh, uh, economists know it as omitted variable bias, where we are studying phenomena, leaving out really, really important variables that can bias our inferences. So left out variable error is a real problem, and I want to get it out of sex research, okay? <laughs> Here's the issue, as far as I see it. Almost all of our research is with individuals where we study the attitudes and the orientations, the cognitions, the normative pressures, the emotions associated with condom use, for example, perceived self-efficacy, how I characterize my partner, construals like that. And we only study it for one person of uh, the couple that engages in sex, all right? Uh, uh, intercourse is basically a two-person enterprise, and there's a whole set of cognitions norms, emotions, self-efficacy, and so on, that have to get blended together to ultimately reach a decision at the last second to uh, engage in unprotected sex or not engage in unprotected sex. And I think it's really important that we do more research on couples. And I don't mean couples who are married, who are cohabiting extensively. These are uh, uh, two people that end up having sex, all right? We need to identify both couple members and start building models that respect the couple dynamics uh, of this. Okay, thank you. Okay, just want to remind the, the light flashes here, but I think we're doing okay because Ted was so succinct uh, that he allowed Jim, they planned this, you know, he allowed Jim to have some of his time. Um, the last speaker is Dr. Helene Raskin-White, and she's a professor at Rutgers University.